good afternoon to everybody. Very nice to see so many students from different parts of the world here today. Just, just to give a take on, uh, I can see all these wonderful faces here and obviously many from Malaysia but other countries as well. Where, where are you people from? Sudan? Sudanese? Anybody else? Just row right here. Sudan. That's great. Welcome. That's great. Great to see you here. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Learn the audience. Find out who they are. My name is Sam. A lot of people call me Uncle Sam. I have been here in Malaysia for quite a number of years now. And when I came here, I started doing public exhibitions in science. And one of the things that became very apparent when we started doing these exhibitions is people wanted their children to do hands-on activities. So when we started the Atlas Space Education Services, we had this amazing demand and the children were coming to us and saying, and the parents, I should say, and they said, have you got camps, have you got activities? This is when I first came to Malaysia. As we moved on, we realized that there was a deficit in people learning science through a practical experience. Now, if you think about it, historically speaking, all famous scientists have something in common, and that is, from a very early age, they found activities or points of focus that made their subject interesting. Personal example, I was given my first telescope at the age of six, and to me it was the most amazing thing of all. I used that telescope, I looked at the trees, I looked at the birds, I looked at the sky, next door neighbor's room. <laughs> I experimented with my telescope, and through that experimentation I discovered about optics and the planets and the stars. <laughs> I won't say the rest of it. <laughs> anyway, can we go to the first slide? Yeah, I'll yeah, point it towards you, do I? Oh, sorry, here we go. Okay, we're going to try a little experiment. Can I just, somebody turn these lights off very quickly? Because what I want to do is talk about what has happened in teaching science. I want everybody to pretend that the centre dot is theory. I want you to stare at the centre dot. Fix your eyes on it, fix your eyes on it, stare at the centre dot, try not to move your head, and tell me what happens. Look at it very carefully. I can see it from here. What's happening to the colours? Exactly, they disappear, don't they? <laughs> Maybe, can everybody see that? Strange, isn't it? Focusing. Let's call that dot theory. If we focus on theory, the colours disappear. And this is what's happened to education throughout the world. We can put the lights back on. Did you see that? Who got the effect? Who could see it? Okay. It's a, a little demonstration, if you will, of what has happened in the schooling system, not just here in Malaysia, but throughout the world. Let's go to the next slide, this is the one here. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry, that way. Ah, oh, there we go. How do we learn? You think about it. What is a learning experience? What is it that you take away with you? How does the, the learning experiences come to you? And from my extensive experience in 300 schools in this country, I've seen the learning experience firsthand with many, many young people. Not just with school students, but with university students, and even with adults like myself. We're a bit older, we take longer to learn. But the learning experience is important. How do we learn? And more than often, that learning experience is developed from a small spark, if you will, a, a seed, a seed of an idea. I go back to that point in my life when I was given my first telescope. What did it lead to? An interest in astronomy, an interest in space science, an interest in physics, an interest in the universe that we live in, 
a knowledge of optics and optical systems and how lenses work started from a very small point. For me, that was the learning experience. I think everybody here has probably had a similar experience, something that happened when they were young, some small thing perhaps, that you think, wow, oh, that's amazing, isn't that incredible? And then you take up that experience and you lead you on what I call the fractal pathway. The experience starts at the bottom, who knows where it went in any part of the branch of my fractal tree, as they call it. Okay, next slide. Oh, we got back at that again. <laughs> All an illusion. Hang on. Okay. So how is curiosity seated? Think about it yourself. Curiosity is the most important attribute of the human species. Without it, we would not be sitting here today talking with microphones, using projectors, exploring space, roving on Mars, using art and science. And that is, for me, the most important question. How to see curiosity? How do you start that process working? How do you begin to get people to think and ask the question, why? Is it so? And to me, that's the most important question of all. You look around you and say, why is it so? And this is where we find seeds of curiosity. What critical elements make a learning process? A large stack of books, mathematics, physics, literature, geography, chemistry, biology, geology, history. This is the theoretical spot in the middle of my illusion of that strange object you saw, the books. Now, don't get me wrong, books serve a very critical function in the learning process. There is nothing wrong with books. What is wrong is that when you make that the theoretical spot in the center of your learning experience, then all the color will disappear. And this is what's happening with education, not just in this country, but in many situations throughout the world. The spot is the black hole which causes the colour to disappear. There we go. <laughs> Here we go. Books, textbooks. How many times have I been to schools and I asked the question, boys and girls, who likes textbooks? That's the response. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> honestly say that they can pick up a textbook and feel like they have learned a subject fully and with a sense of passion. I don't think there's many people, and one of the problems I think also is that we know nowadays that people find rote learning and textbook learning challenging, I think especially for boys. Girls have more capability, more sense of focus, but for us boys, Learning from textbooks ends up with that. And this poor fellow, where is it? There he is, they found this one. I mean, this is one of the students they found in the back of the science class the other day. <laughs> Apparently, he's been there for a while. <laughs> but this is the result of what we call pure theoretical learning. And it doesn't happen just in school, it happens in universities and institutions of higher learning as well. I'm saying to you here, it's not enough to pick up a textbook, to study the theory, to do the examinations and expect to have your curiosity develop, your sense of knowledge develop. It won't do, I'm sorry. So what we have been doing for the last eight, nine years here, and also in other countries, is this. Experiential learning, it is to me the foundation of the learning experience. You don't pick up a textbook first, you pick up a handful of straws and you make a bridge. You learn to be an engineer, you take a new approach on the science of engineering. Yes, 
You can learn the theory, you can learn why bridges collapse, you can prevent them from collapsing by scraping them, but this is where you gain that fundamental seed of knowledge which is so important to develop your career potential later on. And all I can say is that as an employee, I often ask students, what do you do in your spare time? Now, even if you were 30 years old and you told me that you made bridges out of soda straws, I would probably give you a job. Because that to me is much more important than somebody who said to me, I go to the shop on all the weekends. That's not a that's not a life, that's not a career. This is this is the start of true science and engineering. And it happens with all the famous scientists and engineers that I know and I've heard of, it starts from simple projects like this, folding a paper or a plane, learning how to make bridges out of soda straws. Hot slices of science. There is in some of our programs here, it's a bit hard to see the detail, but what we try to do is bring science into the domain of the hands-on and experiential activity. And you can see the girl up there, she's flying a 16 jet, and these little boys and girls here have just been experiencing the whole element of what we call the aerodynamic theory. They're small, but they understand it, we can tell them about it. And at the bottom here, you can see this is their jet powered cars. And we get them to build their jet powered cars. They become engineers, they become designers, they become scientists and competitors as well. Because if they don't build their cars properly, they don't win the race. And these are the elements of experiential learning that I think are very, very critical. Foundations to theory, feeding them the vegetables, a small anecdote. A very dear friend of mine called Mona, she comes from Ireland, she had two boys and they didn't like eating vegetables. They just would not eat the vegetables and this was a worry. So what Mona used to do is she made this big pot of beef stew. The boys loved beef stew and secretly before they came home from school she would take all the vegetables, put them in a blender and make a sort of blender juice. Then she'd pour that in the soup. The boys love the soup, they never realise that they're eating vegetables. And this is what we have to do with the theoretical side of learning science, because we have to face the fact science is about two things, it's about experiments, and it's about learning the theory. There's no getting around it. We must manage the theory. And what I'm saying here is that you take a water rocket, now, every single one of those formulas I put around there demands understanding with using water rockets. Everything a water rocket does is represented in those formulas there. So what a great way to teach Newton's third law. What an amazing way to teach the relationship between mass and energy. What an extraordinary thing to teach leverages and fulcrums for balancing and making the rocket fly straight. It's all included in a simple activity. And for the activity, you win not only the hearts and minds of your future engineers and scientists, but you win their understanding of theoretical practice by using a simple water rocket. And you can be amazed at the response that you get and the depth of understanding that comes from these very simple activities. Moving further on, there we go, there we go, there we go. <laughs> he's back, he's smiling. He knows now that your activities have relationships to very important theoretical fundamentals and those theoretical fundamentals are represented in theory and in what we call the, uh, the equations we saw there. So what do we get out of all this? The tree of learning. And these are all activities we've done in the past. We've done a lot of different things. We've had the building aeroplanes, we've had the design space stations, they put rockets together, they experiment with hovercraft, they participate in artistic activities and robotics and electronics, and this to me is the foundation of engineering, it's the foundation of science, and then it's easy to attach the theoretical learning to any of these activities here. So in closing, I would say that we must come to understand, each and every one of you, that in the end of the day, 
But it comes to the point where you want to get a job, you want to go out there and be part of the workforce. If you have not participated in the practical learning experience that makes the circle whole, then your chances of employment are going to drop very, very dramatically. Because any decent employer, and I'm sure my colleague who spoke previously would agree with me, that if you come to the employee's table and that person asks you, what have you done? I got my degree. Not good enough. It's just not good enough, I'm sorry. If you're going to be practical about this, you have to do the science. You have to do the engineering. It doesn't matter how complex or simple your task is, I appreciate that effort, and if people have made that effort, then I will give them a job. And this is what we have to start thinking about, not just from the early age, but to adults and younger students such as yourselves. Thank you very much. I'll just get the last slide, because this is where you might end up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. You're welcome.